Welcome to the Australian Biocommons webinar series. My name's Christina and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Manager and I'll be your host for today. In this series, we aim to share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools for the life science community. We invite local and international peers to present a bioinformatics topic that we hope will support Australians to deliver their best environmental, agricultural and medical research. You can keep up to date with the latest Australian Biocommons news and events via the channels listed here on the screen. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we come together today. In my case, this is the Wurundjeri people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their value contributions to Australian and global society. In our mission to improve the digital infrastructure available to life scientists, Australian Biocommons and our partners regularly meet with the world's best innovators and enablers to understand if their approaches and products might just be the solution we need. The Australian Biocommons team were keen to investigate how NextFlow Tower can interact with institutional, national and commercial compute and cloud services. Our focus is always on community scale benefits. So we've opened our discussions via this webinar, offering everyone the opportunity to join in and ask questions. Sakara Labs is a leading provider of open source workflow orchestration software needed for data pipeline processing, cloud infrastructure and secure collaboration. And we're really grateful to have two members of the team with us today. They've been very generous with their time and are joining us at 8 p.m. and 2 a.m. in their respective time zones. Firstly, we have Rob Lalonde here. He's the Chief Commercial Officer of Sakara Labs. Hi, Rob. Hey, folks. Welcome, everyone. Nice to be here. Thank you very much for being here. Great. Feel free to reach out if you have uh, questions uh, post the the webinar, obviously, you have my contact info there in the slides. Thanks. Now, thank you very much, Rob. And today's speaker is Evan Floden. He's the CEO and co-founder of Sakara Labs and a founding member of the NextFlow project. His role at Sakara is executing on the vision of simplified, scalable analysis pipelines in the cloud. Evan has experience bringing transformative healthcare solutions from ideation to market through roles in biotechnology and medical device industry. He holds a PhD in biomedicine for work on large scale sequence alignment. His broader interests encompass everything at the intersection of life sciences and cloud computing. So I'll hand over now to Evan to start your presentation. Oh, awesome. Thank you very much for the introduction, Christina, and welcome everybody to this webinar. Thanks everyone for, for making the time and, and joining. So we're going to talk today uh, mostly about NextFlow Tower, um, which is really our, our sort of infrastructure side of, of what we do at, at, at Sakara. But I wanted to set the scene a little bit um, with NextFlow and really how we came about developing Tower, what the background was, really so it kind of sets the scene for, for, uh, for really what we, what we ended up building. Um, over the last couple of years. So first, a little bit of background on myself and, and on, on the project. My background was much more like in biotech. Um, as you may be able to tell, I was originally from New Zealand, but moved to Europe to do bioinformatics, really got sort of soil biology was becoming digital and really wanted to get some, um, some experience in that. And it was really when I moved to, to CIG, that, um, which is in Barcelona here, that I met my co-founder, Paolo Di Tommaso. And this was um, nearly coming up to about eight years ago or so now. At the time, he was working on some, some sort of interesting technologies on the way that you could combine things like containers. Um, the cloud was becoming very interesting at this time, GitHub, et cetera, and kind of bringing all of these ideas together for developing at, at times a workflow, um, a workflow engine. And this workflow engine obviously eventually became Nextflow, um, which we've been working on now um, for quite some time. So just to set a little bit of background on, on what the kind of problem we went to solve initially was. We kind of see that there's, there's a couple of issues um, that existed around handling uh, bioinformatics data, but also the common problems that we were seeing around uh, in bioinformatics. One is that these data analysis pipelines can get really complicated and they can get complicated in a few ways. 
One of them is, is really around the, the volume of data that you need to deal with. So we all have very much increasing data sets. The other is the different tools that you need to deal with. So you have many different tools. Maybe you're taking something from GitHub, some, some code that you're taking from Bioconda. You need to kind of pull all this together. The flip side of that is that then managing the, the infrastructure, managing the cloud, managing the cluster integrations can become, can become difficult. So what we're trying to solve is, is both of those problems in the context of, of teams of people who are collaborating together, maybe collaborating from other sides of the world who need to share infrastructure, need to share results, need to share, share data, et cetera. And then finally, we're trying to kind of do that to, to, to via what we think is the kind of the key entry point to this, which is for us data pipelines or the actual analysis itself, um, particularly distributed compute. So what are data pipelines and what are we trying to do? Well, here's a kind of typical example and, and a very much an idealized example of what a data pipeline is. You take some input data, in this case, you've got some reads, some germline reads, some somatic reads, say, and then you've got some fast queues, you process them through some, some pipeline, maybe you process them in parallel um, in this case. Then you need to do some variant calling by say comparing the two samples together with several different tools and you get some result and some output. This is kind of, as I said before, a very idealized view of what they are. And in reality, these things become much more complicated, become much more nuanced. And if you have some experience writing pipelines, you can, you can understand that over some time, um, you're gonna be ending up um, with some pretty complicated um, pipelines and managing all of that um, orchestration becomes, becomes quite a challenge. So here's an example of, of what a realistic pipeline looks like. This is a, a companion, so this is a parasite genome annotation pipeline. So annotating um, parasite genomes. And you can see each one of those circles uh, on the right hand side there is a script or a piece of software or a tool. And you can see that the data kind of flows through this um, via these arrows, which link these different tools together. So these things can become incredibly complicated and kind of managing um, that is, is kind of main thing that we were going after uh, with Nextflow itself. So kind of summarizing, uh, summarizing or generalizing the problem, we thought that everyone's got large data. This is coming from sequencing data. This is coming from imaging data, but we see all sorts of, um, sort of new, I guess, data types coming up um, and, and challenges that that possesses. Bioinformatics is typically file-based, so we're dealing with big files, which are just huge strings. That means that the kind of the tools that we need to deal with these are a little bit different than, say, um, typical database-like um, executions that you, that you see in, in some other fields. They're also embarrassingly parallel. This means that we can take our samples and we can kind of split them up. And we just run, maybe you run, um, say, BAM tools or something on each of your samples. This means you parallelize it sort of what we call it an embarrassing way. Well, this basically means at the task level and each task gets sent off to be computed on some, on some cluster or to some, some VM in the cloud. And this means that you can really parallelize them in this way. We use a ton of different tools in bioinformatics as well. And we typically, we don't want to rewrite these tools themselves, although obviously many people do. And one of these things means that, one of this means is that we're often taking things um, from things like uh, Conda or Bioconda, there's over 7,000 packages. You wanna be able to pull those things off the shelf and use them very easily. However, that this creates um, some difficulties with dealing with dependencies. I'm sure if many of you have been in situations where you, know, you spend a lot of time when you first start a bioinformatics project, just installing software or even just installing software from someone else's toolkit. So we really want to kind of eliminate that problem as well. You also end up with situations where the dependencies can conflict with each other. You have one version of this that sort of conflicts with another version um, of that that you need. So that, that kind of creates another problem. And that kind of dependency tree um, can often make the pipelines very fragile. So we published early on, um, 2017 here, a um, pub publication around Nextflow. And our first kind of angle in on this, at least in the academic perspective, was around reproducibility. Uh, it was kind of, you know, it still is a very, very uh, hot kind of hot topic. And what we we're able to show here is that essentially developing, writing the same pipeline with the same versions of, of software, um, everything identical, is that you could still get different results depending on the operating system you used. So in that uh, annotation pipeline I showed you before, we observed that we were getting genes which are starting and stopping in different places, depending on if you ran that in Mac or if you ran that in Linux. And obviously we're able to solve that now via, via containers, but it was a kind of a nice insight into some of the problems that you have um, and, and some of the challenges in, in writing pipelines like this um, and, and making them, in this case, reproducible. Um, there's another example in, in the bottom here where we did the same thing with Callisto and Sleuth, the quite common transcript 
uh, or, or, or quantification tools. And, and there we were seeing the genes which would be called as differentially expressed were different in, in each of those. So reproducibility was one part of it that we were kind of thinking about and, and sort of say the first angle on that. But there's also some other parts that we truly think are also as, as um, just as important. One of them is, is, is portability. And this means to be able to take your, your analysis, to take your, your pipeline, maybe to take your data, and to be able to give it to someone else and run it in a different infrastructure. Um, this obviously has some important um, aspects around actually just being able to publish your work or to be able to share it with colleagues and say in different with different infrastructure. Um, but it also links into this third point here, which is around scalability. And if we're trying to improve the quality of the software which we develop, then we obviously want to try and incorporate some modern software development practices. And one of them is really around test-driven development, the idea that you write a small test data set associated with your analysis, with your pipeline, that can always run, that you can link in with continuous integration. That means that I want my pipeline to be able to run on my laptop, and then I want to, when I need to, be able to scale it out into the cloud or into the cluster, point it at the big data set um, and run in this way. These pipelines also become increasingly used in production settings or in clinical settings, and therefore they need to be very, they can be validated, so they, okay, they can need to be tested um, and, and be able to have the, the outputs of them kind of verified um, and, and stored um, and validated in this way, as well as usable. And, and by this, I mean not just usable by a bioinformatician, definitely not just usable by the person who wrote the pipeline, but really used by people who, who don't even know ideally what, what, what Nextflow is or what, what bioinformatics is to a certain extent. Um, so that makes it kind of usable in the sense of creating very simplified GUIs for, for launching these things. And the other end of the spectrum is um, people who need to integrate their pipelines as part of larger systems. So we need to be able to launch them based on API calls or integrate, um, say, some long-running services uh, for the execution and the monitoring of those pipelines. And that's very much what we're going to talk about um, and what I'm going to show you in the demo later on um, with Nextflow Tower. Okay, so that kind of brings us to our uh, solution for, for, these, uh, for these problems. And this, this is where we developed Nextflow for. So Nextflow is an open source workflow manager. It's a couple of things in itself. One of them is it's a way to write pipelines. So you can think of it as a language or a syntax for writing these pipelines. You take your existing code. So this could be Perl, Python, Bash scripts, et cetera, R scripts, anything that you've existing that you've already got. And you wrap those in uh, those kind of code blocks in what we call processes. You then link these processes together with data flow programming, which I'll explain in a bit define the dependencies for those tasks, and then you wrap your pipeline in a Git repository. And this kind of approach has become um, quite, almost quite popular or quite a kind of common way to do things now. But uh, early on, this was kind of really an emergence of, of several different technologies um, at the time. So the key point though, is that once you have an Nextflow pipeline that is developed in this way, you can then run it automatically on any of the different supported platforms. And those supportive platforms are traditional um, schedulers, things like Slurm, LSF, uh, PBS, et cetera, as well as the managed services in the cloud. So AWS Batch, Google Life Sciences, Azure, as well as Kubernetes and, and some more system custom executors there. The point though, is that because there's a separation between the definition of the pipeline and the actual configuration, essentially where it runs, that means that you can take things off the shelf uh, and essentially run them anywhere. It also means that the community can come together, develop those pipelines in Git, or develop those pipelines in some common repository, work together, get domain experts, and, and then anyone can kind of take them and leverage them there. And this, this kind of ability to have very complex pieces of software made up of a hundred different steps, you know, hundreds of different software tools, and be able to collaborate on them, I think is a very powerful um, and, and maybe one of the most powerful lessons about Nextflow project so far is this sort of enabling that, enable something that we didn't even imagine um, would, would, would be, would have happened. Okay, a little bit on the syntax itself. Uh, it's designed for, for, for scientists, for engineers, bioinformaticians. You wanna be able to write uh, highly parallel applications uh, and, and, and workflows without having to really have a ton of experience in doing so. So on the left-hand side, you can see a task, you can, here we can see we're using salmon which again is a, a quantification tool and you reuse your existing script this is something that you might type into the command line now or something that you have in a script existing 
you define the inputs, the outputs in the script section, and then you link those script sections together, or you link those, sorry, those tasks together um, inside, this, inside this workflow block. And we'll see a little bit more of what, what that looks like in a moment. I just want to go over some of the high level kind of differences here and, and, and significances. Nextflow is not the only workflow manager out there. Um, there's a couple of different approaches here. Some popular ones include things like things like SnakeMake. Um, there's also some language specifications, um, things like CWL and, and Whittle. Uh, and this, this kind of point just kind of go through some of the differences and then what makes Nextflow a little bit unique in some of these uh, in some of these ways. So the first of all is that it is a, a custom DSL. So this is a domain specific language. It's a, it's a language, it's a syntax written on top of another programming language. This can be useful in the sense that it allows you to very quickly write a pipeline because the key things you need to do, define processes, link them together, do modifications on, on, on channels is all kind of pre-written for you. But in situations where you need to do something um, a little bit different, you can access the underlying programming language underneath. So this is a kind of key difference with something like CWL, where it's a specification itself and you're kind of stuck in with, with, with what's available to do there. It has this programming model, which is a little bit different. And this is what this is where the kind of data flow part of Nextflow comes from. So it's called what we call a reactive programming model. What it means is that all of your tasks, all of your, all your processes that you set up are kind of alive. And they're sitting there and they wait for data. They react to the data entering them. And the kind of this ends up in a cascade um, of, of the ability to kind of have millions of, of tasks from a single execution of an Nextflow pipeline. So this really makes it highly, uh, uh, highly scalable in this manner. And it takes a little bit of getting used to it, though, in terms of the way that the model, the model works. Another thing that was really kind of the key decision early on was this self-contained approach. It means that every task that you run, so if you have a pipeline, you might have, you know, 100, 10,000 tasks, whatever, each of those tasks is its own working directory. And you can think of it that each is like an, an, a complete independent unit of compute. And this makes it very powerful and kind of lends itself very nicely to the idea of using containers because containers are kind of like an environment um, that you can essentially put some compute in and run in some, um, in, in some third party service. And that kind of, those kind of ideas match together really well. And the final one here is around this, this, this portability, which I said before around the separation of this, to the, the definition of the pipeline from the configuration itself. Okay, what does it look like in practice? Well, let's have a look here. We can see that this is a task example, BWMM, like something that again, you might do from the command line. How do we write this in Nextflow? Well, we take the existing um, command line here, we wrap it in a process block where we define the inputs. So you can see here, I have a reference and a sample. Define the outputs. These are things I'm gonna capture from the output of this, of this process. And then I define the script section, which can remain exactly the same as I, as I would before. Now the real magic though, the real kind of part of our kind of data flow here is linking this together. What do I want, how can I use say, the, the BAM sample here uh, downstream. And the way that we can do this, and this is the kind of thing that's a little bit different here, is what we call these channels. So this BAM channel, if I use it, I can take it from the output of my align sample and use it as the input of this index sample. This is a downstream task, something which is going to take place after this. And the way that the model works is that both of these processes are, as I say, alive. And as soon as the sample BAM enters into that BAM channel, it will fire off the execution of the of the second task there. Um, so that's kind of, and that kind of cascades through, obviously the pipelines can become very complicated and they've got all of their links together, but it's really simple in the way that each of those channels really defines the linking between the processes um, themselves. Here's a kind of more technical ex um, explanation of this. So these are what we call asynchronous first in first out queues, and they really link processes together. You can also do operations on them. We can modify them. Um, etc. Okay. In practice, you could imagine that the channels themselves, they contain data. Imagine that we had a channel where we had three fast queue files and we wanted to do some processing on them. We wanted to treat each sample in a parallel manner. What we would do is we would place each of those files into a channel. So we'd say, okay, this channel contains X, Y, Z here, these three files. And the fact that the channel contains three files would mean that we would get three executions um, of this process taking place, what we would call three tasks. So a task is a, um, a single initiation of a, of a process here, which would create three outputs. 
It's a little bit, maybe a little bit technical, but let's imagine it in practice. So I had a FastQC process that I wanted to run here. It was just running FastQC on some, some samples, on some reads here. I could set this up to run with a single sample by saying this channel, the samples channel contains only a single sample, the sample.fastq file. And if I then wanted to say, okay, well, now I want to run it on all my samples. I simply specify that I want to put star fastq. And now fastqc will run all of those in parallel. And like, and when I say in parallel, I mean really in parallel um, in the sense in that they are, they are completely operating. If I have 100 CPUs and I've got 100 files there, and they're going to be running um, in, in parallel in that, in that manner, or they'll be submitted out to my cluster or my queue, et cetera. Okay, that was kind of a very, very kind of 10 minute introduction into the syntax itself. Let's think about now the deployment, because this kind of goes into more of where we're going with, uh, with Nextflow Tower. So there's a couple of ways you can run Nextflow itself. Uh, the kind of main basic way is, is via local execution. This is typically when you're developing an application or maybe you're doing some CI, CD work, you need to run a small test data set where Nextflow runs locally on a machine. It could also be situations where you uh, spin up a big box, maybe like, you know, 64 CPUs and you just run everything locally in that, in that machine. Uh, obviously that has some limitations about maybe it's not the most efficient use of resources, but it's certainly something that's possible. And you can do that with or without containers. In that scenario, Nextflow is using the local storage for the intermediate files um, that are taking place there, um, and it's kind of running in a, in a pretty basic manner. What's obviously very popular, though, is the ability to connect in instantly with your cloud and uh, with your, sorry, your cluster resources here. And these are the traditional schedulers, things like Slurm, um, Grid Engine, et cetera. And here Nextflow submits each task to make each Nextflow task execution becomes a Slurm job, for example. Uh, and this is this can be a very useful approach. It makes it very easy to interact with a cluster. It also makes it very powerful in the sense that you don't have to change any of your configuration. Now you no longer need to think about um, necessarily what's the specific commands for that cluster to, to do this. Nextflow takes care of, of that. And again, it will take care of the fact that there's a um, there's an idea of what CPUs are, there's an idea of what memory is, of what queue, of what a queue is, and all of those things can be translated across the different uh, execution platforms they support. What's become really popular, though, is this managed cloud um, batch orchestration. So this is things like AWS Batch. And in this case, what happens is Nextflow submits each task to, say, the batch API. And that batch API, in turn, is linked to a computer environment with some VMs. Those VMs will spin up uh, as that task uh, enters the queue. And from there, it will run the task. And then from it will uh, run the task, say, put the data back into S3 and then those VMs will go down. The nice thing about this is you scale to zero. So you can ask for, you can require you know, 10,000 CPUs, but I only need them for a couple of hours because I need to run some big sequencing experiment very quickly. And then I want to kind of kill everything afterwards. And that, that, that approach can work very powerful, particularly in bioinformatics where we have very um, sort of lumpy workloads. Often we need a lot of compute and then we need nothing or we need specific resources, GPUs, et cetera. And then I need something that I don't necessarily need to buy. Um, it wouldn't make sense, but I could I can kind of rent them in the cloud um, for a certain amount of time. And then if you want to go to the next step and actually manage that cloud infrastructure yourself, um, there's kind of a couple of ways you can do this. This is a little bit of a detailed explanation on what happens, and, uh, and at least in AWS, where you can have multiple jobs on the same virtual machine. So there's a kind of bin packing problem, which is taking place here, um, which again improves the efficiency a little bit, because uh, it means that you can have essentially a collection of VMs which are spun up, and then those, those tasks are automatically going onto this. I should say that as a user, you don't really need to know any of this. This is kind of more of the, the guts of what's happening in, in the back there. And we've been, we've been spending some time on looking at how we can improve the performance of this, because now we can make it very easy to, uh, to set up that infrastructure. And I'll show you how we do that. That means that we can start to think about what's the most efficient way to run bioinformatics pipelines. And is there things that like obvious, easy things that we can do that improve that? One of this is an example with, with uh, GTK here, where we were looking at, could we use like a shared file system in the cloud, so in this case is FSX versus using um, S3 storage. In S3 storage, you have to kind of transfer the data from uh, each of the individual uh, from the storage bucket to the virtual machine, run the job, and it goes back. With FSX, you no longer need to do that. Now, there's a trade-off here because the FSX has a cost associated with it. So there's a cost associated with having that disk 
uh, while, the, while the workload is running. Now we were actually able to show here that even though it's more expensive uh, in the sense that you have to have the, uh, the storage, it turns out to be cheaper overall because the virtual machines are, uh, are oh, sorry, the, the runtime for each of those virtual machines is actually lower. Um, so it means that the overall cost ends up being lower and you end up in some cases up to sort of two and a half times faster. Uh, so this is, we think there's a whole bunch of um, things that we're, we're really working on here. And again, making that easier for people to, to utilize um, and, and access in that way. Here's a quick um, kind of visualization of, of that portability and how it works. So I could run my Nextflow script, Nextflow run, or just run locally uh, with the local executor here on my machine. I could specify then, okay, I want to take that pipeline, maybe something off the shelf, and then I want to run it in Slurm. I specify execute Slurm, my queue, how much memory I want for, the, for each of those tasks to run. And then I could say, okay, I want to take that same pipeline and literally just need to change out here the executor pointed at AWS batch. Um, it still has the same concept of what a queue is. So it has an abstraction for queue, abstraction for memory, et cetera. Um, so it will convert those numbers into the, um, the corresponding ones for the API, in this case for batch, and then run the job um, in that way. Now, a lot of these things are all kind of um, uh, all kind of key, the fact that you write the pipeline um, in a way which is decoupled uh, from that. And that portable deployment also relies on a couple of other things. And one of the main technologies for doing that was, was containers, obviously. And containers, um, if you're not familiar with them, I think, I think they're becoming you know, much more popular than when we, when we even started the company three years ago or so. There was sort of um, not so much awareness of them, but it's really become a, a, a driving force for, for a lot of this portability that comes about. Comparing them to virtual machines, so obviously they can spin up very fast. So this means that you can have a, have a container which comes up really quickly. Virtual machines were typically a bit, a bit slow to do this. Um, but it also means that they're they're immutable. So when you when you spin up a, uh, a container every time, it's going to be the exact same state that you built it in. Which means it's obviously this comes down to the reproducibility, makes it makes it very easy. They're composable, so you can have layers, you can build containers on top of other containers. And there's also just really just a whole bunch of great tooling out there for for using them. I mean, things like the advent of of, of the Docker tool set um, of container registries, which are available to everybody now. That has made all of this um, really easy to use and, and kind of we're uh, piggybacking on the back of, um, of a lot of other technologies and really just taking containers and using them in a way to not, they weren't really designed to be used, but it's, um, they kind of work fantastic for, the, for this way. So Nextflow has support for um, Docker very early on actually. So Docker was released in, I think in the middle of 2013, um, there was the first talk about that. We kind of saw this technology and thought, hey, we can really take this and, and to use this for, um, for bioinformatics workloads or for long running workloads. You can see here, there's also been some, um, some other supports that come in. So things like Singularity, which is really for using containers and HPC environments, uh, things like Podman. Um, there's a couple of others that Nextflow supports as well. And they're all essentially runtimes for it. The nice thing about them is they're generally pretty interchangeable. So you write your pipeline once, you define it with say Docker and the other formats are able to, uh, to handle them in this way. Okay. One thing I think is really good is when, when to use containers and like once you get used to them, uh, hopefully the audience is now um, say more used to this is, is, is really always, once you start using them, they're really kind of uh, hard to imagine how you did bioinformatics before. You know, things about the spending so much time installing software is, a, is hopefully a thing of the past or at least something you do once, um, which is when you, when you create the container. Okay. Some high level things now on Nextflow itself. So the project has grown um, quite considerably, particularly in the last couple of years. A lot of that has really been driven, um, not necessarily by say contributions to the Nextflow uh, open source code, um, which obviously are you know, very valuable, and, but it's really comes about from, from, from contributions of the community of Nextflow pipelines. So this means people who are coming together to create these pipelines, sharing them with the community and working together um, in this way. So we're up to around 10,000 people who read Nextflow documentation uh, every month. And as part of that, like a big driver has been, as I said, this, this project such as NF Core, which is a community uh, which came about sort of organically from a couple of Nextflow conferences. And from there, they've been developing these pipelines, which you can now kind of take off the shelf um, and use that. So if you're interested in, in this, I'd recommend going checking out NF Core. 
Um, we'll show some pipeline examples in a moment, but you can join the Slack community here. They've got a couple of thousand people there. Um, very, um, very welcoming community as well. Um, and, and very useful for uh, say taking stuff off the shelf, but also then you know, contribute back, maybe modifying it. And we see a lot of customers now who are coming to us primarily to run NF core pipelines, which is obviously great to, great to see. Okay, another couple of things here around the, um, the use of Nextflow. So one, one thing we've been you know, really pleased to see is the way that it's been able to be taken very quickly and adopted into projects and then run um, is, is kind of real, relatively significant pro uh, projects in this case where uh, uh, the UK has been very kind of forward in the sequencing of, of the COVID, um, particularly around the identification of variants. And, and one of these things was the development of a Nextflow pipeline very early on. Uh, that was taken up um, by uh, this consortium there. They were even able to distribute that pipeline to different infrastructure groups around the UK. And then as part of this, I think over at least at least five, there's one group or uh, well, this one consortium has, has published around 25% of all of the uh, COVID sequences to date. And that all of that gone through a single next flow pipeline, um, which they which they developed. There's obviously been many others that have been developed um, for, for this analysis, but kind of think it's a nice uh, it's a nice kind of showcase of what you can do with Nextflow to be able to create a pipeline very quickly, share it, and then run it on distributed uh, and on different infrastructure depending on what's a, what's available um, at the time. We see it like a lot of adoption as well in the um, in the life sciences area generally. Um, so we have commercial deployments of Nextflow Tower inside of uh, many large pharma companies, AstraZeneca, Roche, Johnson Johnson, etc. And we also see a kind of big increase of this, and particularly personalized medicine space. So there's a lot of sequencing data, particularly companies who are um, sort of cloud forward in this way, um, maybe dealing with clinical data or, or production like setups, where I think Nextflow is a very kind of sweet spot for Nextflow. Obviously there's also the traditional um, research organizations, et cetera, who are, who, are, who are using it in this case. While, while kind of Nextflow has, you know, you know, it's, it's a very useful tool, we developed it really for the bioinformatician who you know, had the problems that we had around wanting to write these pipelines, um, share them and kind of run them in different infrastructure. There's still some limitations associated with that. So if you have a command line tool, it's not really typically very good for having long running services. It doesn't have a database on the back end. Um, it doesn't, it's not very useful for sharing, you know, a command line tool with, with colleagues or kind of interacting in a, um, in a collaborative way for that. So while Nextflow kind of makes it easy to use all of these different compute and, and, and uh, allows it to use containers, et cetera, we found it kind of quite difficult on how, on how we were going to take it to the next step of, of this. And so sort of thinking about this, talking about this with users over many years, we started to think that we needed something else uh, other, than, um, other than a command line tool for doing this. And this is really what we developed Nextflow Tower for. Um, so Nextflow Tower is full stack web application. So it's a, it's a, you can think of it as a centralized command post for your Nextflow pipelines. It's a full kind of management piece of software. And we thought about a way to kind of go about this early on about what kind of model we wanted to use here. And this obviously um, has been in the past, things like, like SaaS-like approaches to this problem where there's a service running which you go pay to use. Um, and we didn't think it really fit, fit well with what we you know, kind of the Nextflow way of doing things, which is really just install something and, and run it anywhere. And for that reason, we've decided that the Nextflow Tower should be as portable as Nextflow is. So in the end, you can take Nextflow Tower and you can install it on your laptop. Um, you could pull it up in your cluster, or you can run it in the cloud if, if you wish. We started off with the monitoring of the workflows, so the ability to monitor them, understand kind of what's happening, have a database on the back end, and then moving to things like be able to launch them via GUI, via API, team management organization, as well as improving some of the, uh, the ability to, uh, to set up and to provision the infrastructure uh, for, the, uh, for the compute environments. So I'm gonna go and give you a little bit of demo now on, on how it all works and, and can, so we can see um, how this works. So I'm gonna show you Nextflow Tower and this is at tower.nf. And I should point out this tower.nf uh, is available for you, free to use to go to evaluate here. So I'd recommend you can go try this out um, if you wish. What you can see is that uh, first thing is that you can log in here with any authentication provided. So um, we provide for our customers, of course, their own authentication here. So when they install, if they have um, any kind of open ID connect or, or any setup here, they can have their own authentication. I'm just gonna use GitHub here um, for my login. 
And the first thing we're going to think about is how we can do what the most kind of common action, which we want to do, which is typically launch a pipeline. Uh, so a pipeline here is, is, is something that we want to is be predefined for us and that we just want to kind of kick it off um, and launch that. So I've, I'm in my own personal workspace here. I'm just going to first off like select a pipeline that I wish to run. And these Explode pipelines now have um, customizable GUIs for each of those pipelines, which is defined in the pipeline script. So here you can make it really easy for people who don't really know anything about Mixflow or even, or even too much about bioinformatics where they just know, okay, here is, my, uh, here is my pipeline I wish to run. This is the type of input data. Maybe it's some back bio data. Maybe I want to have drop down menus uh, associated with that, but it can make it pretty trivial to, to kick off and, and launch a pipeline now. Once I launch a pipeline, again, this can be, this can be any pipeline in this case, then I can start to think about kind of visualizing um, the results of, of that. So here are some, some pipelines I've, I've launched before. Here's the one we've just kicked off. You can see that in the back end, it's really just running Nextflow. So there's just, it's really kind of running Nextflow here um, or a long running service for, for launching Nextflow pipelines. You'll notice that Nextflow, when it runs, it runs Git repositories. So this could be public or private, could be hosted Git um, as you prefer. And then you have parameters, um, the configuration, the execution logs, and you can kind of follow these things live. One of the Explo's real advantages is the ability to relaunch a pipeline. So maybe something failed and you want to relaunch the execution and it'll kind of start from the beginning. Uh, if you know anything about Nextflow, this is the resume functionality. So it uses the hash um, of each of those tasks and is able to compute or, or only compute the, the tasks which have failed and kind of kicks off at the, um, at the right stage. You can also do things like download the logs, uh, have an execution timeline, Etc. Visualize the visualize what the execution of that pipeline looked like. Understand which steps are taking long, etc. Um, for, for doing so. Now I should point out this. This is all able to all of these features and functionality are able to be run on any of the different computer environments, uh, which I'll show in a, in a moment. You can see here you get some general information. So the name of the pipeline where it ran, and this is running on AWS Batch. You can see that it's connected to. Um, AWS batch in, in Paris. So this is EUS3, the version of Nextflow we used and the work directory, which in this case is an NS3 bucket. You have the status of the tasks as they run through, the processes on the left-hand side, as well as some aggregate statistics. And on the back end here, we have a full database of all of the cloud costs for all of the different cloud providers in all of the regions and all of the instance types. So this means that you're able to quickly sum up all of those costs and, and generate an estimated cost, which can be sometimes very difficult and people are a little bit say hesitant to go to cloud because they don't know what's the what's kind of not even like the the, the true cost of this but at least what's an estimated cost of, of what I'm running am I was it ten dollars or was it ten thousand dollars and obviously there's a you know some fear around um you know about burning through your 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 PI's credit card um in, in this regard so it's just kind of ways to to kind of create some guardrails um around that and make that simpler for people to use there's information around um, efficiency but I think what's I mean, what's use, most useful here is that is to jump into the task information. When you have a pipeline, which is 10,000 tasks, going in and understanding exactly what's happening in each of those, searching for that, maybe assigning, finding out what the error is, can be, can be particularly difficult. So here we can jump in and we can see, okay, this is the, this is the different task for this. Let's go see like FastQC. You can see this command that was run for this. You can see the exit status, work directory, et cetera. I can also see the execution time, the resources requested. So this was running in this container on this queue with two CPUs, six gigs of memory, six hours uh, on AWS batch, on this instance type, uh, on, a, on a US3 on, on spot instances. And this is the total cost of that, of that task. That's the resources that were requested um, in this regard. But I can also see the resources that were actually used. Um, and comparing these two can be quite useful because it means that now we can start to Think about optimizing them. We've got a full database now of all of that information. How can we visualize that firstly, but then also kind of act on that to try and save resources and make our pipelines more, um, more efficient as they run. So there's a visualization of that. Um, at the bottom here, you can see this is kind of CPU usage or, or memory usage um, for these different tasks. So you can see there's quite a few different processes uh, in, in this step. And you can see that each of them, this is kind of getting towards I'd say somewhat efficiency would be sort of around 70, 80%. And this is running on test data sets. So it's pretty low um, in terms of the memory utilization here, but something that you can always optimize uh, from within inside Nextflow and, and specify. We're working on optimizing this automatically now um, at, at time. 
so you can see that this is this first pipeline here is kicked off. You can see that these tasks have been submitted to us. And in a moment, I'm going to go through and I'll show you into, into AWS and kind of show you this is kind of transparently happening in your own account, in your own computer environment, whether that's Slurm or, or AWS or any of the um, any of the different execution platforms um, that we have. Before we do that, though, I want to quickly show how can you create pipelines from uh, for different users. So how do I say make that a uh, pipeline which I'm developing and make it available for other people in my group, maybe people in my institution, maybe you want to make it public and available um, for the world. So to create a new pipeline here, we simply select the pipeline that we want. We can put in a name um, that's required here. The first thing that we want to do think about is a description as we want, but all Nextflow pipelines are Git repositories. So this means that I can go into here and say NF core, select the pipeline that I want. You could choose anything from Git. Um, I'm just going to select something um, relatively simple here. So let's say we want to run this pipeline. I'm just going to copy the Git repository here and paste this into here. I'm then going to select a description. Let's just copy paste this description and paste this in here. You can choose a computer environment. Um, I'll show you exactly how we set these up in a moment. Um, but for now, I'm just going to choose my default one. So let's just choose batch in Paris. Once I selected a pipeline, it's going to show me all of the Git commits and all of the versions, the tags, the branches that are available to me to run. So this means kind of going back to the reproducibility element, it enables me to specify, you know, really a particular version of a pipeline or a particular code commit that I'm launching here. Um, and then all of those things come together to really make the pipeline very you know, reproducible in this sense. And we're just leveraging Git here, there's you know, so many fantastic tools out there. Um, why not make the most of them here? So I'm going to say here, RNA, let's just say RNA seek, we'll do bio commons here. And then I can choose a config profile. So look up the config. I'll just put some test data in here. And we are good to go. Create the pipeline. This then becomes available for anyone in my workspace uh, to be able to run. They select the pipeline that they want. This will have a custom GUI here. So you can see there's input, output, email, multi-QC. We can save these merge fast queues and, and launch this pipeline here. This form, so this is kind of something which you would define inside the Git repository here. So this is kind of a nice feature which we've added in the last six months or so, but it's really the ability to define custom GUIs and custom forms for it, for your input of your Nextflow pipeline. So this leads us to the ability to also do parameter validation in the future. So we can say, okay, this, this file should have this format and it will warn you before it kicks off the pipeline. Or you have things like, um, when you saw before, I just was saving the merged fast queues. This was a Boolean. This is the icon that was used for that. And all of that just gets rendered inside of Tower uh, for, for being able to launch there. There's a couple of other ways to launch pipelines than specifically through, um, specifically kind of doing them via the, the GUI here. You can launch them um, via what we call actions. So actions are ways that I can create an endpoint specifically for launching the pipeline. So exactly the same as before, where I create a pipeline action. It's the same setup as creating the pipeline before. And that action, in this case, is an endpoint. So this is a launch hook where if I hit this location here, so if I hit this endpoint with my parameters, that will then trigger the execution of the pipeline. This is a kind of easy way into the API. And the whole thing can be defined by the API here. So you have full, full access to the documentation um, for all of the endpoints. So the whole tower system is, is controlled by an open API um, in this regard. Other ways of doing this, we have a command line interface tool. So instead of saying Nextflow run um, your pipeline, Tower launch is, um, is coming out and, and, and that'll be out in a few weeks time. In terms of the runs as well, there's more information here so that you can get um, firstly data sets functionality, which is which will be pretty cool. So this means that you can define data sets just like CSV files. Currently people typically upload these things to a location. So your CSV files telling you where your, rate, where your reads are and then you launch the pipeline. We're going to linking data in as well as reports, so the outputs of the pipeline um, to make them make them visible. But I think the most interesting thing to talk about now, um, sort of finishing off this, is really around the infrastructure itself and how easy that can be to set up here. So you can see here that this is running. Um, we've got some tasks running. This is running in AWS Batch Paris. I'll show you now what's happening in the back end. So this is happening kind of transparently, as I said before. If I go into 
my batch environment. I'm in, let's just make sure I'm in the right zone first. So I'll go to Paris uh, inside of here. I'm gonna to go to then um, batch, which is the, the kind of main service that Nextflow interacts with. And then if we go into batch here, you can see all of my tasks, which are running here. And if I have towers providing a, an interface into this, and you can see that we've got these queues, which are automatically created by tower. And then you have computer environments and those computer environments link in to each other. So this computer environment uh, this is gonna be 04J. If I select um, that computer environment itself, that is, that is, if you're familiar with AWS, that is actually an ECS cluster, which is, which is gonna then in turn spin up EC2 instances, like spot instances um, based on that. And those spot instances then it kind of it manages the, the ability to kind of control them to, to it doesn't bid on them anymore, but uh, um, at the price that you specify. Uh, and then from there, spin up those machines, the, the tasks themselves will run as Docker containers on side those, um, on side of those tasks. So you can see those are running here. So if I select on this task, you can see that this is um, the individual task which is launched there. If I look on the EC2 instances inside of this, um, if I was to jump into here, you'll see that underneath, it's actually just a big C5 large instance. So all of that compute that we have here running is really just a, a C5 large instance. Now, if I send a hundred tasks or a thousand tasks, there'll be multiple of these which gets spun up. Now, this is a very powerful and a very, very useful way to run pipelines, but it's very intimidating for most people. And maybe showing you this, you get a kind of feeling of that. That's not something that I want to be touching um, and, I, and I typically want to be sitting up. And it's one of the things we try to spend a long time thinking about. How can we make that easy? How can we make that accessible? And the way that we did this is via this concept of computer environments. And these computer environments here can be set up for any of the different cloud providers or, or, or on-premise schedulers or, or Kubernetes environments. Now, I'm going to show you how I can do this completely on the fly. So let's give this guy, say, AWS batch. And let's just say we're going to do this for Bio Commons. I can choose a platform here. In this case, Amazon. It's very similar. I put my credentials in here. Uh, this is just a, a key. The permissions required for that are, are shown below. I choose a region that I want to do this in. Uh, I think I've got some buckets in, in EU S1, so I'll select that. I'll select my working directory. This is using the API to look up and show me what resources I have available, which is also very nice for, for this. It means that I don't have to remember exactly what's available. I choose how many instances, I, or how many, sorry, CPUs in total I want that queue to have. This is kind of a limit on how big that cluster should grow to when I'm submitting thousands of tasks. So let's say 256. I can choose some auto, EBS auto scaling here. I can choose you know, various different systems for uh, EFS, FSX, so it's kind of performance storage updates. If I want to get really advanced, I can be, okay, which instance types do I want to put in there? Do I need GPUs? Do I need to have specific things for this kind of workloads, which I can place in, inside of that queue? But ultimately, all of that just needs to be created um, in this way. And from here, this will create the queue for me. This will create the compute environment. This will do the linking of those resources. And within about 10 seconds or so, this will have created those resources inside of AWS for me. And we will be able to simply then go run the pipeline um, with, with that computer environment. I'll show you another quick example of this, how this looks like for something like Slurm. So for a scheduler here, instead of using the cloud credentials, we would use SSH credentials and we'd specify similar things. So again, we'd have a work directory on our Slurm cluster. We would have a username we use to, to log into that as well as the, the, the Slurm queue name for the next flow job. So we call the head queue job and the Slurm queue for the, for the actual task jobs themselves. And they can be obviously overridden from the next flow um, configuration. All of this can be managed um, in the context of teams though. So you have organizations inside of the application. And this means that you can kind of think of several users here, like someone who wants to run pipelines, someone who wants to create pipelines and someone who wants to manage the infrastructure. So from inside of here, the Secure Labs, I can go inside my verified pipelines. You can see I have credentials here, which are then shared credentials or credentials available to um, everyone in, the, in this workspace, what we call it. We have participants who can have different roles here. So I could be an owner in this case, maintainer, launcher, et cetera. And those different roles um, are really kind of define how people can interact with the resources and the permissions that they have um, to, be able to, to be able to do so. Um, let's just go quickly um, and consider 
um, a few more settings in here. From the organizations themselves, you can see that we have um, the ability to, to create different workspaces. And workspaces are the main ways that we interact with this. You can also have members. So these are these are people who are part of your organization um, and as well as um, teams itself. You also have the ability to have like an admin panel. So this is if you are kind of a global admin of the whole uh, of the whole application. Um, and this means that you have, have a fair bit of control um, over that and the way that it runs. I think I'm getting towards the end of end of time here. Um, so I think I'll um, I think I'll stop sharing now. Maybe we can take some um, some take some questions for the last ten minutes or, or so. That's perfect. Thanks very much, Evan. Uh, thank you for the um, excellent overview of um, Nextflow and Nextflow Tower and a showcase of what's possible. So now is the time for everyone in the audience to send through your questions. Um, please type any questions you have for either Evan or Rob uh, into the Q&A box and we'll do our best to answer them. We'll just wait a few moments for some Q&A to come through. So Evan, if you did have something quickly you wanted to, to show, if you're feeling cut short of time, we might have a few more moments. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I can always also just speak about sort of where we're going with this in the, um, in the future as well. And, and obviously, this is this has been a, a couple of years' work. Um, we started off uh, in kind of the model for this, which can obviously a lot of people often ask is, you know, what's the business model then if you're if you're a finance? And and the way that we think about it is, is, is really so we're an open core company where, where Nextflow is the core of that. Obviously, ninety nine percent of the value that we create then is is really you know, um, provided for people who want to use Nextflow. And, and the model is really around is really around people who want to use Nextflow in production, and particularly in organizations then um, who, who want to deploy Nextflow Tower. So, as I said before, you can take the application itself um, and then and then run it uh, any way you want. And the model for that is a kind of a subscription license to install the software um, for yourself. I think there's, a, there's a question there: is is it possible to implement Nextflow Tower locally, linking it to a local cluster? Yeah, so you can you can take Nextflow Tower itself. Uh, it's a couple of Docker containers uh, itself with a, with a database on the back end. So you install it in your local cluster, like you would a similar service. Think think about something like uh, uh, RStudio that's available for everyone, or, or Jupyter Lab, something like this that you would install Tower, and then you would link that to your local cluster, maybe a Sloan cluster, etc. That you could um, that you could install that. An interesting point on that is that. Is, is, is that it's very kind of um, distinct where Tower is installed and where the execution. So I showed you all those execution um, compute environments. So I showed you all the different ones now. Tower in this case is actually installed in AWS, um, I think in, um, in London, but all of the people who are using Tower, they're connecting to their clusters all over the world. So they have, the, have their clusters, um, you know, essentially anywhere. And there's a kind of clear distinction there between where Tower is installed and, and the computer environment itself. And I think this creates kind of portability that we have um, as well. There's a question there as well. Does Nextflow support a private Git repositories? Yeah, absolutely. So you can, from Nextflow yourself, you can have um, your private Git repositories to, to log into so that we're using the, the traditional keys. And then there is a... Uh, as well as inside of inside of Tower, um, there's a kind of credential management, which I can quickly show you here. Uh, the credential management here, you create new credentials provided for Bitbucket, GitHub, GitLab, etc. If you have another um, Git provider that you want integrated here, that's always possible as well. This also works for like self-hosted. Um, so if you have your own GitLab, you can point it at your own URL there um, for, for doing so. So that can be quite useful for um, for kind of people working with that kind of model. Okay, there's another question there. Um, what's the recommended strategy for migrating existing legacy pipelines to Nextflow? I think that the, I mean, if, you, if you're going to do, to do it yourself, which obviously is something I'd, I'd recommend, there's a kind of key concepts that it's probably worth investing a little bit of time understanding the Nextflow model. Uh, there is a couple of blog posts from, I think from six months ago or so now, it kind of summarizes a lot of the learning material for going through that process of, of learning initially and converting those pipelines to Nextflow. It starts off for kind of like five minute overview things and then goes through to, you know, full 10 hour courses if you want to, if you want to do that. I can sh um, quickly share with you um, the, the blog post link for that um, right now. It's a bit of a blog post called Learning Nextflow in 2020, I believe. I'll just paste that inside of the, inside of the chat. All right.
Right. Well, I think that is all we have time for today. So I'd once again like to express our thanks to you, Evan, and also to Rob for taking the time uh, to talk to us today, especially given the unsociable hours that you've joined us. So thank you very much for being here. Anytime. Thanks a lot, folks. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. Thank you. So just before we wrap up, I'd like to share some information quickly. So this webinar is part of a series of training events organised by the Australian Biocommons. You can find out more about upcoming webinars, workshops and events on our website and watch recordings of previous uh, events on our YouTube channel. Finally, we'd like to acknowledge our funding. The Australian Biocommons is enabled by NCRIS via Bioplatforms Australia funding. Thanks so much for watching and we hope that you enjoyed today's presentation and that you'll join us again in the future soon. Until next time, goodbye.